Hi guys, this is Mr. Bennett. Uh, we're going to try something new tonight. Instead of taking our notes in class for notes number six, the character six of life, uh, we're going to take them at home. You have guided notes that I gave you in class, and you're just going to follow along this video, fill in your notes, and then after you fill in the notes and you finish the video, you can go on and answer the questions in the online survey that I've provided the same page as this video. Make sure that you submit that tonight after you watch because we'll need that in class uh, tomorrow. So um, keep in mind that you have the ability to pause this video, you have the ability to rewind it if you miss something or you wanna watch something again, and you have the ability to rewatch this video before the test. So if you wanna brush up on your eight characteristics of life, you can come back and watch this video again. So very, very cool in terms of uh, you have the ability to go back and see the lecture over and over again and maybe fix some things that maybe you didn't understand before. So anyhow, let's get started with this. So the first thing I want to talk about is the definition of biology. If we take the term biology, biology is our class, right? That's what we're talking about in this, in this class. Uh, biology can be broken up into the prefix bio, which means life, and then logi is uh, to study something. So biology is the study of life, if we just break it down word-wise. And scientists who study life uh, need to be able to define life. So what we have done is we've taken eight characteristics and said that all living things must have all eight characteristics of life. So these are must-haves, meaning you cannot be considered a living organism if you do not have all eight characteristic characteristics of life. So characteristic number one is that you must have cells. All living things must have at least one cell. Okay, so there are some things like bacteria down here that are unicellular, they only have one cell. Okay, Then you have organisms that are multicellular, like you or I, or this plant down here. You can see the leaves, uh, the many, many cells within the leaf. But basically a multicellular organism is something with more than one cell. Characteristic number two is kind of an intense one. The idea is that life has organization, meaning organisms are highly organized. They have cells, they have behaviors, they have organs. There are many different things within the cell, outside the cells, within the organism, outside the organism in terms of its behavior and things like that, that have to be organized to keep it going. So three examples. Uh, first of all, we have organelles. They kind of think of organelle as a miniature organ, okay? An organ like your heart, your stomach, all right? These are the organs within the cell. So these are structures inside the cell that perform a specific job or role some pictures of that down here. So this is a cell, it's an animal cell. You have something like uh, this organelle right here, number one, that's the nucleus, it protects the DNA. Uh, it's the genetic site of the cell. Uh, over here, number nine, this is the mitochondria. It has the ability to convert our food into usable energy. And then we have other organelles within the cell, but they all perform a specific job. So they, they have a role that they perform within the cell. Just like our heart pumps our blood, Within the cell, you, you have certain tasks that need to be completed. Second example of organization would be tissue. These would be groups of cells, and they all have similar specialized abilities. So we have different types of tissue within the body. Here's one example right here. This is smooth muscle tissue. So uh, this would be like the muscle that surrounds your uh, stomach, for instance, or your intestines, helps to move your food throughout your body. And the idea behind muscle tissue is it has the ability to contract. That's a specialized ability. So all of these cells work together as muscle tissue to contract for a specific job in the body. Third example of organization would be if we take multiple types of tissues, we take groups of tissues, and we form a structure that performs a specific job for the body. This is an organ. So for example, we have the heart over here. The heart is made up of muscle tissue, it's made up of nervous tissue, it's made up of multiple different types of tissues working together to pump blood throughout the body. All right, characteristics three and four. Characteristic three is the response to stimuli. Now this is also referred to in some books as a response to the environment. The overall idea is that organisms can respond to physical or chemical changes in their environment. So over here we have the meerkats. If a predator shows up, if they hear a sound that maybe sounds like a predator, they just get spooked in some way. They'll respond to that stimuli. A stimuli is just some sort of stimulus. OK, 
okay it's something that uh, they're able to detect and it achieves a response within them so that is a key thing here the idea is you have to be able to detect it okay it has to be detectable so uh, for instance humans do not have the ability to see uh, UV light okay it's outside of our vision range so UV stimuli uh, we can't respond to it based on our vision now our bodies can respond to it in other ways uh, but generally speaking you can't respond to UV light uh, unless it's under certain conditions our second example here is the sunflower sunflowers have the ability to detect sunlight this flower will basically face the sun throughout the day so as the sun comes up the flower will actually turn to face the sun absorbing that light making its food as the sun goes across the sky the face of this flower will actually follow the sun across the sky so the stimuli in this case case of the stunt of the sunflower is light the light triggers a response meaning the flower will follow the light across the sky characteristic number four is homeostasis homeostasis this is a hugely important word for the year okay you need to make sure that you know this one okay we'll continue to talk about it throughout the year this is when organisms are able to maintain certain internal conditions despite changes in their environment what that means is the environment may change but these internal conditions will be controlled will be held stable despite those changes so for example down here we have body temperature now humans were known as warm-blooded right it's kind of a general term for us and uh, pretty much whoops should be a nine pretty much anytime your body should be roughly 98.6 whether you're in a cold room or you're outside when it's warm your body will adjust conditions it will adjust internal conditions to make sure that you are at 98.6 so if it gets too cold your body will do things to produce heat uh, if it gets too hot your body will do things such as sweating in this picture to get rid of some of that heat another example of something that we do to uh, basically in this realm of homeostasis is we maintain our blood pH uh, think of it like the acid within our blood. In fact, our blood is actually not acidic, it's slightly basic. Uh, we need a blood pH of around 7.3. And different things that we do throughout the day may cause this number to fluctuate a little bit. But there are different activities within the body, there's different uh, mechanisms in the body that will keep our blood at 7.3 despite the other things that we're doing that may cause this to change a little bit. So this might go up a bit, but then the body's gonna immediately drop it back down to 7.3. Or this may drop a little bit, but then the body's gonna push it back up to 7.3. We maintain 7.3 because that's where we need it. Characteristic number five is metabolism. Metabolism is when organisms convert energy stored in chemicals into a usable form. There's really two different types of metabolism in the world. Basically, organisms can be put into one of these two groups. So the autotrophs are known as the self-feeders. Examples here would be something like a plant. Okay, anything photosynthetic, there's also another group known as the chemotrophs, or the chemosynthetic organisms. But they're all able to use energy from non-living sources in their environment. So for example, plants use light. Okay, light is not alive. They use that to provide the energy for all of their activities. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, the other group, are known as other feeders. They have to consume other organisms to get their energy. So an example would be like this tiger down here. Okay, This tiger must consume other organisms in order to get its food, Okay, in order to get its energy, to, to stay alive, to repair itself. Uh, if this tiger gets injured, it's going to co you know, cost energy to repair itself for reproductive purposes, uh, just for moving around. Uh, life requires energy and so this tiger will get that energy by consuming others autotrophs on the other hand like this plant is just gonna suck up light non-living sources from the environment to provide all of its energy for growth repair etc characteristic number six is growth okay which is powered by metabolism which we were just talking about this is where organisms get larger by cell enlargement or by adding more cells so there's really two different things you can do. 
um, a small cell, a brand new, for, brand new uh, form cell, will have to get bigger, grow to adult size. But then once it's an adult, if it's gonna add more cells to the body, if it's part of a multicellular organism, it will split. And so you'll get two small cells. These cells will then in turn grow up to be adult cells, full size cells, and then they will divide and so on. Now, another factor in growth is, this, is a, an idea known as development. This is where a multicellular organism begins to mature and then certain cells begin to specialize, meaning they start to take on specific jobs. So maybe this cell right here eventually will give rise to cells that will turn into the heart. Okay, or maybe this cell right here, um, as it divides and creates more cells, maybe uh, that will end up turning into, say, a hand. Okay, so certain cells will begin to take on specific jobs. And even as we get older and we're in, you know, teenage years and then adult years, uh, certain cells will continue to develop, to specialize. Uh, for instance, during puberty, you have cells that begin to specialize and they create things like changes in the voice or changes in your body type. All right, characteristic number seven, reproduction. Here we're going to create new organisms similar to themselves. Okay, all organisms must be able to do that. There are two different categories of reproduction. You have asexual reproduction where no partner is needed. Uh, you basically create an exact replica or clone of the original. So you have a cell and it splits to make two cells identical to the parent. Uh, basically, um, asexual means uh, without sex or the idea that they do not need a sexual partner. Uh, sexual reproduction, on the other hand, does require a partner. You have two parents. Okay, They each provide uh, some, genetic inf in some genetic information. They actually give up half of their genetic information. Okay, So if we put those two together, then we get a whole amount of genetic information or basically the offspring. And the idea here is that sexual reproduction creates a genetically different offspring, meaning this offspring is not identical to either parent. The last characteristic is known as change over time. Another name for that, it's known as uh, evolution. And you need to understand that change over time affects populations. It's not an individual thing. So you or I are not expected to change over time in this context. Okay, we do change, but not like this. So a population is a group of organisms, meaning a group of the same type of organisms. So like a group of zebra, a group of giraffes. Okay, They have the ability to adapt to a changing environment. The environment does not stay the same. It changes. So certain food sources may run out, certain predators may become more prominent, meaning you get more of them, or uh, maybe a predator disappears entirely or maybe a brand new predator shows up, but the existing populations need to be able to adapt. So uh, for instance, down here, I had, what I have are four different finch species, and they've each adapted to a different food source, but they all came from an original finch that showed up on this island. So in the past, there was a finch that showed up on this island. He flew over from South America and eventually his his basically grandchildren or their grandchildren this is probably a whole population of finches that showed up their grandchildren adapted to different foods so maybe some of them specialized in eating nuts maybe some of them specialized in eating insects um, others specialized in eating say uh, I don't know, this would be like seeds uh, and then uh, maybe like a cactus eater um, longer, sharper beak that's good for eating cacti, for getting in between those little spines. But the bottom line is that this original population adapted to a changing environment. Okay, They actually migrated, they wound up in an environment they had never been in before, but they had the ability to adapt. Okay, so that is our video. Make sure that you uh, fill out your guided notes. If you need to go back, you can rewatch parts of this video. Just rewind. Um, and make sure that you answer the online survey that uh, is just below this video. Um, make sure you answer each question, you put your student ID number in there, you submit it, and then uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow.